Kira kato, kato katoa. E mihi atu ana ki na iwi o te mato a maui. Ko Bruce Clarkson a hau, ko Taranaki te maunga, ko Manganui te awa, ko Nati Pakia te iwi. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. The rest of the information you need to know, I guess, is up on my first slide. I do work at the University of Waikato, and I'm particularly interested in urban restoration, and I lead a research program, which I'll mention briefly today, called People, Cities and Nature. And the order of those words is pretty obvious why, after yesterday in particular. So we live in an increasingly urban world, 54% of the world's population live in cities, and by 2050, we expect that 64% of those people will live in cities. And of course, New Zealand is no different because we are largely urbanised. I've been thinking a lot about what we can do about assisting our biodiversity, reversing biodiversity decline, and I've been wondering for quite a while, what if we thought about cities in a different way? What if we thought about cities as being a solution to saving biodiversity. And when I say biodiversity, I love the word nature way better. It's something we can connect with the public with. Native plants and animals, nature, green space, and that broader concept in which the topic is nested, the concept of natural capital. Now, New Zealand's main urban centres are shown here on a map, and the significant thing about them is that they do tend to be largely coastal, there are a few exceptions. The city I come from, Kirikiri Ra Hamilton, obviously, is inland. But the point about their location is they are in the zone which was formerly the richest biodiversity resource of all. They had interfaced between land and sea on the coastal margin, and in the lowland zone was clearly the richest place for the expression of Aotearoa and New Zealand's biodiversity. And so when we talk about impact on the landscape, our cities are responsible for a lot of that decline. And when I heard Bruce Wills talking yesterday about farmers and their recognition of you know, the issue of intensification of the rural zone, just remember, there is no urban divide. We're all equally culpable because we are the resource users that have been harvesting and using all of the production. And we also have been contributing by way of an ecological footprint for Auckland City, for example, which is at least half the size of the North Island. Our cities, though, by world standards, are rather small, and our population density is rather light. And this is a huge advantage that we have. The question is, how long will we retain that advantage? Will we maximise and make use of that advantage? So we have comparatively full, a small footprint for the built up matrix of our cities and the statistics are there and you can read them for yourself. But the thing that's always concerned me is the last statistic in bold. Native vegetation cover in the built up part of our urban centres or cities ranges between less than 1% and 8.9%. Compared to other cities around the world, this is spectacularly low. Some cities like Perth, for example, are up at 25 to 30% of the city and still retained in native vegetation. So um, this also has caused me to think a little more about, about the way the biodiversity is distributed on our landscape. And this graph here is a simple attempt to, to understand the one ecosystem of New Zealand. Because actually New Zealand is one ecosystem and in fact on the edges of that, it's part of a bigger global ecosystem. And the way that our biodiversity is distributed on our landscape is the clue to how we need to manage and retain it on our landscape at a broad regional scale, and what we might do to ensure that all New Zealanders get direct access to our indigenous biodiversity. So, harking back to the, I guess, the figure that I was talking about before. So New Plymouth City is shown on this red curve here. It's the place that has the most indigenous vegetation cover, which I'm using as a surrogate for biodiversity. 
in the built-up matrix. It declines rapidly in the peri-urban zone, and of course, when New Plymouth City was built, there was an original plan for a green belt. That was dispensed with, and instead the focus went on intensification of the adjoining rural zone and conversion to dairying. But as you move further out from the centre of the core of the city, you start getting on to the peripheries of that great national park, Egmont National Park. These cities here, the B's and the C's, are the Wellingtons and the Nelsons of the world that have the, you know, the constrained feature close to the coast with a backing of hills. And the hills, of course, because of their rough topography, have maintained good cover of native vegetation because essentially it was just a little too difficult to get rid of all of it. But the cities that have borne the biggest brunt of all are the ones shown in the flat line curve. Seven cities in New Zealand have this curve, and so if we were going to be serious about looking after our indigenous biodiversity, we have a major challenge. Now, obviously, within that seven are Napier, Hastings, Christchurch, and Hamilton, the city where I come from. I've been particularly interested in this 10% figure because I think we always need a target to aim for. And at the crazy and ambitious conference that occurred at Te Papa early in the year, I floated once again the notion that all urban centres in New Zealand should be aiming for at least 10% of their built-up matrix to contain indigenous ecosystems or plant communities, whatever you want to call them, to retain our own biological heritage. And people have said, well, yeah, why 10%? Well, there are some very good reasons based on science for the 10% figure. There's a recent paper just been published in New Zealand Journal of Ecology, I think, which helps with this. I'm going to show you some species area curves directly after this, which also back up my proposal. So the, the paper by Ruffel and Didham points out how important it is on a regional scale to have at least 10% indigenous habitat, if we're going to be serious about looking after, for example, our native birds. The work of the Finnish ecologists, these species decay curves for the size of the habitat are very important. Once you get below 10%, you get an out of proportion loss of the representation of the species of your district, of your locale, of your region. And that is why I think that a target like 10% is one worth pursuing. So I'm going to try and build my case now by going into my case study. And you knew it would be Hamilton, of course, because that's where I come from, but also because of its relevance to Cape to City and Napier. I think there are a lot of things, a lot of com um, comparables, some points of comparison, complementary approaches that could be used here in Napier and as part of Cape to City to bring back indigenous biodiversity. So Hamilton is sitting in the middle of an indigenous biodiversity desert. The Waikato region long ago cleared and converted to intensive dairying mostly, but some cropping and, and uh, horticulture as well. And you do need to go at least 15 kilometers out of the city center before you run up against a decent stand of native bush. The story I'm telling is also a story of the evolution of the way we've approached restoration ecology in Aotearoa, New Zealand, the way we've evolved our conservation biology. At first, in Hamilton City, we focused on looking after the tiny little fragments that were left of the indigenous habitat. And they are tiny in Hamilton. 67 key sites identified in the city plan mean size 1.1 hectare. Some notable people here on the boardwalk of one of the most important sites, to Papanui or Claudelands Bush, 5.2 hectares. That's our biggest bit left of what used to be there. And the notable people, of course, that's Charles. Charles is back there. And in front of him, uh, Richard Louvre, the author of Last Child in the Woods. 
So the point I'm making here is that we started by focusing on those little bits and trying to protect them, to really give them the care and attention they needed. And this work in Hamilton City has been going on for more than 25 years. When I moved across from Rotorua, formerly working in the DSIR, you talked about the DSIR, <laughs> Rud, I went across to Hamilton, and this work was already started. And this is the story of, I guess, of conservation biology in New Zealand. The focus on the extant, the existing re resource at first. And so we know a lot about how to manage existing resource. You know, we remove the weeds and the pests and we try to buffer it and expand it and connect it and link it. But the point I want to make today is that in cities like Hamilton, Napier, Hamilton, Christchurch, whatever, that won't be enough to maintain, even maintain biodiversity on our landscapes. And it won't be enough in that broader regional space either to ensure that we retain the biodiversity we want at a broader scale. And for those places, I believe, we need what I call reconstruction. So reconstruction is moving beyond revegetation, which was the, an approach we used in the mid 70s where we just roamed around the landscape and planted trees and shrubs. But you know, we need to take that another step. We need to have the notion of target ecosystems and habitats and bringing back full assemblages and species occupancy, basing here my, my concepts on the work of McGlone and Bill Lee, Matt McGlone. And we need to build habitat for all components of ecosystems and not just for bringing back birds. In Hamilton, we've been using a natural successional framework approach. That's where we attempt to mimic nature by putting in pioneer plants first, mid-successional plants second, and then starting to work on bring back the late successional species. I need, to, I need to remind people of this because this is actually the most cost-effective way of doing this job. And of course, using the appropriate species, despite a little slip up in the Parliamentary Commissioner's report about ecosourcing, I, I, I support ecosourcing entirely. And you need to know your own local flora inside out to know how to do this properly. And here in Napier in the Hawke's Bay, you have this amazing resource, for example, of pioneering species, the divaricating plants that can cope with the dry climate. Can't forget about them. Anyway, I better get on and, and talk about the case study. So we started first in about the year 2000 in the Hamilton Gullies, and I use the word we all the time because the we I'm talking about is a consortium, a partnership of the community mostly, led by the community, working with government agencies and other, you know, a wide range of agencies working together to get the result. So if we didn't have Hamilton Gullies, we didn't have this unique landform on our landscape, we would have had absolutely no biodiversity. Indigenous, that is. But we have this amazing resource, this network, this arterial system, if you like, of gullies coursing all the way through our city, connecting up with the biggest gully of all, the Waikato River. But unfortunately, when we started this work, of course, we encountered the novel ecosystem, and there are still scientists around who are saying that we need to get over novel, novel ecosystems and live with them. But I say no. We need to give top priority to our own indigenous habitat. And so we've been working away there, trying to convert the grey willow ecosystem into native forest. And when I say the grey willow ecosystem, the grey willow ecosystem also containing every weed known to humankind. Our target e ecosystem for the gully bottom is the semi-swamp forest, dominated by kahakatea, with a late successional element that comes in, the pukatea, and a mid-successional tree, which is the most amazing tree for restoration in our city, waiwaka, or swamp mairi. Waiwaka has pneumatophores it's completely adapted to the waterlogged soils of the back swamp in the Hamilton Gully, and we're all watching and waiting and hoping like hell that the myrtle rust doesn't start hitting our Waiwaka. So the question is, how do you do it? How do you put it back together? 
And I'm just going to show you some slides now that give some examples of how we, how we get it back together. So these are all gully sites. You can see here Munga Iti Gully, where the early successional phase, dominated by the native Caraxes, has been fully established after seven years. Remember that all of these were once grey willow ecosystems. And then over on the right there, my own backyard, where with my family, Bev and my daughters, over a period now of 25 years, we have converted a will willow ecosystem back to a Kaikati Yosemite swamp forest over an area of about an acre. And my neighbours have watched me doing, doing it and they've all started copying. And so we have a, a small you know, cell of activists who are converting the whole of the Ornukutara gully back to indigenous habitat. Some people have been doing it for way longer than me. Um, Elwyn Seeley was a, a doctor up at the Waikato Hospital and in his weekends he restored his gully. And so at the New Zealand Ecological Society conference last November we had a, a field trip to some of these sites. And just to show you that I'm social media proficient, <laughs> you can see there an Instagram posting by Tim Park. I think Tim's in the audience there. And we had this little dialogue going on about how far have we got with the restoration? How real is this? Well, you know, I know for a fact that several people who went on that field trip from other cities did not realise until later that this was a reconstructed Kahagatea forest because it's got most of the ingredients there. In the same way that we learned that restoring remnants was not good enough, that there was a need to expand them and connect them, in the same way that we got started in gully restoration, we also realised that that wasn't enough if we we're really going to turn the tide of biodiversity decline. And so we then turned our attention to some open space, some public land up by the Hamilton Zoo, where again many members of the community after a long political process lobbied for a millennium project which was the creation of a natural heritage park which would have within it the examples of all the major habitat types, ecosystem types of the Hamilton Basin, all reconstructed on a site just over 60 hectares that had been previously farmed for about 100 years and has this lovely little peat lake in there, also in dire need of restoration, Horseshoe Lake. First tree planted, 2004, and here is the progress to date. So 2004, starting with the Google Earth image, of a lake with nothing around it apart from grazing land. And by 2017, 31 hectares of indigenous habitat reinstated, making it the biggest remnant, not, well, it's not a remnant, but the biggest patch of indigenous habitat now in the city. And how did we do this? We've done this largely by community action. So every year, the Arbor Day plantings occur this is from June 2016, 1,800 people, 28,000 plants, three hectares planted in three hours. Of course, it takes way longer than that because you have to do all the preparation beforehand, you know. You've got to grow the plants, you've got to lay them out, you've got to do all of those things and get it in place. But the point is, the mobilising of an urban population is the key to getting this work done. Sitting behind it, because although I'm telling you a story, I'm following the model that Ruud advocated. I'd like to take that model a little further. You not only have to tell a story, you have to create a meme. You have to create a meme that people buy into and perpetuate for generations to come. So, we've been doing a lot of research to underpin this work, and I'm not going to give you the details of research. I've just given you a list of some of the work that's been going on just on the one topic of restoration planting in Hamilton because everything I've shown you in those slides has sitting behind it some science. I haven't just made up the story. Even to the extent of trying to understand how we might bring in the very specialised members of our native flora, the shrub epiphytes, which had gone from our city entirely because Small patches overrun by possums, loss of the specialised shrub epiphytes. So we've been doing trials which have had success rates of over 85% of 
of just putting them back into the trees. Now that the predator numbers are down, the possum I'm talking of here as a predator, and we are able to re-establish the really special elements of the indigenous flora. Now, of course, I've been talking about habitat reconstruction, and I really liked yesterday to hear from Campbell when he talked about the threefold approach. People, pest control, habitat reconstruction. And of course, in Hamilton, we've been rather helped by the Waikato Regional Council program called Hamilton Halo, which has done intensive pest control in a 15 kilometer radius around the city. The red areas there are the bits that have, have received the intensive pest control, the rats, the possums. And in recent times, and I say recent, in the year 2009, we reached what is called the Tui tipping point. We like to call it the Tui tipping point because prior to 2009, they were only rare visitors, extremely rare. In my early 15 years of restoration in the Hamilton Gully, I saw one Tui for 30 minutes prior to 2009. And by the year 2009, a perverse result of the social media postings was people got sick of reporting sightings of Tui post-2009, they just said, yeah, they're there, right, let's get on with it. And of course, the question now is, what is next? So controlling the predators is also critical in this equation, but we cannot forget habitat restoration. We want the total ecosystem, not just the birds flying into the local park to feed on a rhododendron or a camellia. We want the total system. And this slide is from our research, and it just reiterates the point, of course, that predation isn't just about birds, eggs, and birds. It's about what are these predators doing to the seed crop, to the reproduction of our plants. And the curves there are just the seed loss from caged seeds versus uncaged seeds to show you the magnitude of the take by the predators. So we've been doing essentially gully restoration then, which is riparian in its nature, reconnecting a landscape with corridors of riparian planting. And in recent times, we've also realised the importance of the expressed way and the motorway. So there are many ways of building corridors across a regional landscape. The riparian one is, is great, but most riparian planting in New Zealand currently does not follow a what I would call a successional framework. So there's little thought been given to what happens in 20 years time or 30 years time. And the width of the riparian planting is insufficient for a biodiversity corridor. And in the same way, the jury is still out on corridors to do with roading and infrastructure. In fact, I'm unaware of any significant research that's been done to really establish what the merits of these might be. Anyway, we've been progressively working towards a state where eventually, after possibly we have put a predator-proof fence around Waifakariki Natural Heritage Park, we might bring back these treasures, the kaka and the hihi and the kiwi and the tiaki. Although the other day at work at the university, we saw the first signal of a regional scale change that's going on. We got the visit from the kaka just outside my office. You know, we, when people were buzzing about Tui, imagine how they behaved when they saw the kaka. So the point I'm making here is that for this to work in cities around the country, different solutions will be required. In Hamilton, we've done this combination of restoration and reconstruction. We've been restoring the gullies, linking them to the river, looking after the existing remnants, building, restoring, and reconstructing together. And our goal is to achieve that 10% target. We're trying to catch up to New Plymouth, and there are people in the audience here from New Plymouth. They know we're trying to catch them up, and they're already working on upping their game, possibly taking it to 15% when they put in place the project to reconnect the maunga to the city in the Waiwakaiho catchment. I like this to be a competition across New Zealand. I'll like, take about one more minute, I think, Charles. When we sell this idea, both to the public and to politicians, it's important that we ju just talk about biodiversity. 
So we, we use every line of evidence we can muster to convince them. It's part of that storytelling. If you just go on about native plants and animals alone, that won't be enough. So what is it doing? What are the services that are being improved? How will it help the city? How will it make the city more livable? And the one that I like the most of all, of course, is the fourth bullet point down, social cohesion. What you get when you get people all congregating at Arbor Day and working as a community together. It reminds me of the old days in the dairy country, in agriculture. We used to have collaboratives and we all got together and did stuff together. Something's been lost along the way, this individualistic approach. We need to rebuild our communities as well as our, our biodiversity. I probably haven't got time to go through all of the slides I've got here. I know there are lots of constraints in restoring it in urban contexts. I've listed them all there, but I'm confident that we have mitigations for every one of them, that we can do things about each one of them. And the thing that I've been wanting to focus on for a long time are the opportunities presented by urban restoration. And there they are, an engaged and well-informed public who will support conservation across the region, not just in their own backyard, will support it nationally as well because they are engaged and well-informed. And of course, the great advantage of the urban setting, no grazing animals to deal with. And some of those predators that we talked about are also in lower abundance. We've got a number of advantages, but the most important thing, I guess, is the last couple there, the coordinated interagency action, involving the community, working together, not just having a siloed approach where the district council looks after part of the peri-urban zone, the city council looks after part of the city, and the Department of Conservation looks after the dock estate. No, no, it's one ecosystem. To get the response that we require, we must have coordinated action. And the most important thing, if the meme is to survive, Rudd, if the meme is to survive, the notion that we want to retain our indigenous biodiversity, this is the one that's most important of all. Most of us were raised in a generation where we had direct connection with the land. You know, you've only got to go back one or two generations and all of us had a direct connection with the land. But we don't have it anymore. We have to reinstate that connection. And the place to do that is in children's backyards. And so the Arbor Day, we've now got the Arbor Day situation at Waifakariki where children who planted in 2004, you know, who were teenagers or whatever, have come back with their own children. So you're building the meme, you know, you're spreading the word. It is like a disease, a successful meme promulgates itself all around the place. We have to be very careful in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that, that meme does not die. Just because we're talking to ourselves here in this room will not make the difference. So anyway, to finish, I sincerely believe that urban restoration is the new frontier. It has a place in regional scale restoration that cannot be underestimated and I look forward to seeing how the urban restoration will be integrated into Cape to City as well. Thank you very much.